Hi, I'm Ian Carroll, and I'm going to be talking about scrumming solo, or how I use Scrum to teach myself software engineering. Now, if you didn't know, uh, which maybe you're aware of, teaching yourself is hard. Uh, and so basically, these are some cool tricks I learned along the way on how to teach myself really anything, uh, but in this case, software engineering. So uh, let's talk about what Scrum is and what Scrumming Solo is. Uh, first of all, I guess we'll start with what Scrum is. Uh, Scrum is a creative process that is informed by the Agile Manifesto, uh, which is uh, four principles. First, interacting with people is better than following processes. Uh, working examples are better than detailed documentation. Collaborating with clients is better than negotiating contracts and responding to change is better than following a plan. Uh, so you can also just run a scrum with only yourself. And that's where a solo scrum uh, comes from. Uh, you can also scrum anything that's a list. As long as you have it in a list form, uh, it can be scrummed. Uh, your softwares, you will not need them. Post-it notes will do. Post-it notes in a blank wall is really all you need. Yeah, sure, there are tools like Jira or Pivotal Tracker or Trello. Those are all great. Um, but Scrum isn't about the tools or the processes. It's about you interacting with yourself and with others. So let me tell you about a story of what I did before I learned Scrum. And this is an example of teaching myself something else. I decided I wanted to learn Chinese. So let me tell you about that. So um, I spent 10 years learning uh, Chinese philosophy from a master at a Taoist temple. Um, uh, the master only spoke Chinese. The texts were in Chinese. I did not know Chinese. Everything was done in translation and with an interpreter. Um, but I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could speak with the master directly and read the texts myself? Um, but there were issues. Uh, for one thing, I couldn't find time to study consistently. My English-speaking friends thought learning Chinese was some sort of voodoo magic. My Chinese-speaking friends were more interested in practicing their English on me. Uh, there's also a massive scope issue here. This is a huge, huge, huge topic. Asking where the bathroom is is not the same as discussing the philosophical concept of emptiness in modern city life. Uh, so, um, you know, there's a lot going on there. Also, written Chinese is about 50,000 characters just for the written part of it. A spoken Chinese is tonal, so ma is different from ma. Uh, so there's that to consider as well. Um, classical Chinese is not modern Chinese. Chinese is a language that has existed for um, at least 5,000 years in written form. And the earliest versions of that are ones that I would be needing to uh, uh, know about the texts in Chinese uh, about Chinese philosophy. Uh, but it doesn't stop just there. I don't need to just know two Chinese languages. I need to know quite a few more than that. Not only modern Chinese to talk to the teacher and classical Chinese to read the text, but there's not just one classical Chinese. There's the 5,000-year-old one. There's the 1,000-year-old one. There's the 500-year-old one. And there's all the ones in between there. Uh, so, uh, you know, knowing all of that is a massive, massive, massive amount of work. Long story short, I failed to converse with the master directly. Uh, and uh, so what went wrong? Uh, well, uh, basically life is chaotic. There's a lot of things that happen when you're trying to live, uh, let alone, you know, study Taoist philosophy. Uh, you know, there's going to work, there's paying bills, there's when your car gets repossessed, there is, uh, you know, a million things that happen uh, that you need to deal with. Uh, that uh, can throw you off the course of teaching yourself a thing. Uh, the other thing was that the project was hugs. I mean, huge. The project was huge. Uh, so uh, that project was so big um, that I couldn't possibly learn all of that. Uh, even giving myself 10 years, I wouldn't really be able to understand it. Uh, it was just too much to learn. So teaching myself software engineering can be an awful lot like teaching myself Chinese, um, how am I going to do it? Um, so we're going to need to define an engineering challenge because of the fact that this is a huge, huge ocean of stuff to learn, and I'm only me. Um, so how do I learn software when, here are our constraints, I have zero dollars. I work in retail sales. Um, so I can't afford anything. So boot camp ain't happening. 
Um, I definitely can't afford to spend $30,000 or $60,000 going to a boot camp and hope to make up that money later. I don't have it to begin with. And I also don't have a guarantee that I'm actually going to get a job after that anyway. There's plenty of stories of people who haven't. Um, I have to work retail full time not to starve is another thing. So even if I were to get a scholarship at a college, let's say, I can't go back. I don't have the time. I can't stop working in order to do this. So um, that's, those are some of my constraints. However, I do have some assets. Uh, for one thing is I've got 10 to 20 hours a week, and that's because of the fact that I'm not allowed to be worked straight to the bone uh, thanks to labor laws and um, uh, you know, um, uh, the efforts to put those laws into place. So thank you, government. Thank you, um, unions. And uh, thank you, uh, you know, all the people who came before me to give me at least these 10 to 20 hours so that I could actually do this. Um, another thing, uh, basically, minimum wage <laughs> uh, basically means they don't think your time is that valuable, but the government won't let them pay you less. Uh, that's just a funny thing. I don't know why I put that in there now that I think about it. But hey, it's funny. Um, access to meetups uh, is another thing I definitely do have besides 10 to 20 hours a week. Uh, meetups are free. I can go to meetups. That's not an issue. So that's great. Uh, another thing I've got is free books, because uh, I work at a bookstore in this case. Uh, but if you have a local library, you still have free books. Um, and I also have the internet, um, which is also uh, basically anything that you would need to learn uh, uh, software engineering. You can find that online. So um, that was one thing I was told. And actually, it, uh, it's true. Uh, everything you need is online. Um, so here's some pre-Scrum basics. So before I even get into uh, learning Scrum, uh, things that you need to have beforehand. Uh, the first thing is have the audacity to show up. Um, do the work. Um, and also go to the meetups. Um, if you do that, uh, that's going to be enough. I know that's intimidating. I know that you don't know anything about software. I didn't either. But still, just show up anyway. Uh, go ahead and be embarrassed. It's fine. You're going to be. You'll spend your whole life being embarrassed, but if you don't show up, then you're not living. 90% of life is just about showing up. Uh, have the impudence to ask the experts questions. Have the impudence to ask dumb questions as well, especially dumb questions. Uh, those are the most valuable ones you can ask. Um, so, uh, and usually, with most people who are experts, they are happy to talk to you about the thing that they love the most. So don't worry about that. If it's not the case, that's not the person for you to be asking. Don't worry about it. Just move on. Um, these are the two questions I like to ask when I'm asking an expert a question the first time. Uh, regardless of what it is, what's the most important thing to know about blank? And then, how would I get started if I wanted to learn about blank? Uh, and those are the two questions I would ask. Um, finally, have the courage to actually try the things they say. So that is just like having the audacity to show up, have the audacity to do what they say. Don't just get advice and then don't use it. That's a waste. Um, so use every resource you can. Um, things like books, go to meetups, Google, uh, free code camp is another one. Friends, uh, if you have them, Dad's wallet. Thank you, Dad. Uh, thank you so much for uh, getting me the thousand dollars it requires to get a Scrum certification. Uh, that turned out to be very valuable. And uh, to help everybody who does not have a Dad with a wallet, um, I am doing this talk. Um, so thank you, Dad, for improving the quality of software everywhere in the world by helping out your own son. Uh, personal background is another huge thing. You might think that because you're not a software engineer that you don't have anything valuable to contribute. Um, but that's not true. Uh, we need people in every single discipline to be part of software. Uh, from every single background, every kind of cognitive diversity you could imagine. Uh, the more different ways we have of looking at a problem, the quicker and easier we can solve it. Uh, for me, my personal background includes uh, a, a degree in theater. It might sound like it's irrelevant, but actually knowing how to tell a story is a really important part of software engineering. Um, and then another thing I've got is 10 years of Taoist philosophy. Uh, that's really helpful because all that meditation and all of that 
focus on understanding the self was really important in staying calm enough and centered enough and focused enough to actually work. Uh, then uh, there's also Boy Scouts for me, um, or if you have any kind of background in um, uh, social work or uh, service oriented stuff, such as Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or um, anything like that, uh, that is also really, really valuable because um, it will focus you on um, contributing back. Um, it'll also focus you on how to survive. Uh, so those are all things that I had, but those aren't the only skills that are valuable. Those are just the things that I have. You might have a completely different set of things, all of which are equally valuable, equally as valid as what I have. No matter how much anyone tells you those skills are irrelevant, they are not. They are very, very, very relevant. So yeah. Uh, so let's talk about Scrum. Um, it's expensive, especially with that certification. A thousand dollars for two days? That's ridiculous. Uh, but um, I guess, you know, the Scrum uh, teachers need to make some money too. And I mean, they are taking the time out to do that for you. But still, wow, that's a lot of money. Uh, but you don't necessarily need to spend that money in order to do the skill. Um, one thing I would recommend as well is to work in public. Uh, and this is a huge, huge thing. Um, work boldly. Uh, for me, it's because of theater. Um, also, if I flaked, people would know. Um, you know. Also, to encourage others who are in the same boat to do the same kinds of things. I want to show that anyone can do this, and I really do believe that. Anyone absolutely can. Um, to show potential clients my character, uh, because they can see what I've done. Regardless of whether I have zero experience or not, I can actually still show what I can do by working in public this way, using tools like GitHub. Um, uh, they become a portfolio for me. Uh, same thing with blog posts or videos such as this one. Um, another thing is here is uh, my actual uh, Go Scrum Yourself um, uh, repo on GitHub. Uh, that is just markdown files and all it does is document my Scrum process as I was doing it. Uh, I would do that as a ritual to focus myself uh, before I started working uh, and also as a ritual to complete my work for the day or for the week. Uh, and uh, that was super, super helpful. Uh, by the way, the most embarrassing parts of that repo are in the retrospectives. Uh, some of it gets uh, pretty intense, so just to warn you. Um, okay, what a solo scrum offers. Uh, for one thing, it allows for self-discipline in a chaotic world. Uh, because of the fact that I have a structure, um, I can uh, work against that structure and use that to form a habit that uh, no matter how chaotic the world gets, uh, I have something that can resiliently uh, adapt to that. Uh, it thrives in fields where there is more to do than time to do it, do it in. Um, software is this massive, multi-dimensional ocean of information. And to navigate yourself on that ocean, you need a compass. You need something to, to go by. Otherwise, you're just drifting out in the waters and you'll never get anywhere. Uh, so Scrum is a little bit like a navigator sextant uh, or a compass uh, that can uh, focus you, point you in the right direction, and get you where you actually want to go rather than just wandering aimlessly around uh, the ocean or the desert, uh, to use yet another metaphor. Uh, it also responds to changing circumstances. Because of the nature of how uh, Scrum works uh, and the fact that it's an iterative thing where you reevaluate your work every week, every day, um, it means that you can adapt yourself to uh, those, the landscape changing. And that's one thing about software is that not only is it an ocean uh, of multidimensional stuff uh, that you need to learn, but that ocean is constantly changing. Chinese doesn't really. I mean, it doesn't change that quick. I mean, uh, modern Chinese might change a little bit with slang terms and things like that, but classical Chinese is always classical Chinese. It's not changing. This, on the other hand, this is always changing. So uh, if you spent 10 years trying to learn, um, I don't know, small talk or something like that, you might find that at the end of those 10 years, your skill is not as marketable as you thought. So this way, uh, it allows you to respond to those changing circumstances, regardless of what framework is popular, what language is popular, how people like to work, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can, in fact, uh, learn all those things and adapt to the environment that is shifting beneath your feet. 
Um, this allows you to study your study to stay relevant um, and it avoids waste. So you don't spend time uh, just configuring your Linux environment for a year and a half instead of actually doing the work that you need to do. Um, uh, you can uh, use this to check in with people at meetups to see what's valuable and focus your efforts on that, not necessarily on things that you have in your own head, which may or may not be so great. But you might think, isn't Scrum for teams? Shouldn't this be done uh, you know, in large teams? I mean, it is built for teams, right? We're constantly talking about scaling it up to larger teams, teams of 100, teams of 1,000. Um, who ever thought of scaling it down to only one person? Uh, but, um, you know, and it also teams of people who work full time on a project and are paid to do it. Um, yeah, that's true. Uh, you might also ask about uh, where the dev team is if there's only one person. Where's the product owner? Where's the scrum master? Um, where's the product for that matter? But the fact is that you've got the scrum inside of you. You're all of those things. When you're in a scrum of one, you're scaling it down to only one person. You are the dev team, a team of one. You are also the product owner. You decide what's the most valuable thing to do, making sure to go to meetups and things like that so that you can gather data about what the most valuable thing is to do. Uh, but ultimately, you're the one who decides. Uh, you're also the scrum master. You facilitate the rules of the scrum. You make sure that you enforce your own habit here. Uh, all of that is exceptionally valuable for this. So also, by the way, you're the product. So that means that you're using Scrum to Scrum yourself into a Scrumming software engineer who can take on any role in a Scrum team, or all of them. Uh, so here are some use cases. You can learn it. You can use it to learn extreme programming. Lean, Kanban, you can learn it for languages like Python, Ruby, um, or uh, Elixir, who, uh, Go, uh, surfing, uh, ballet, any project, any subject, any skill. Uh, if it can be made into a list, then you can scrum it. So scrum works where no scrum didn't. That's one thing that I did discover. Um, it solved the chaos problem, and it also solved the scope problem. Uh, you know, so much to do and such a chaotic world in which we live in. Um, it provided for discipline using sprints. Uh, sprints is an iteration uh, that you do in Scrum. So every uh, week or so, you might do two weeks, but for you probably just one week is enough, uh, you would go back and, and check in on what you did, um, take what you have learned so far and, and say, this is done. Uh, so it allowed for me to set small goals that got feedback quickly. Um, it also allowed for better understanding of what I am capable of. Uh, so I, not only did I achieve something every week, something small, something measurable, uh, but I also learned what I was capable of actually doing, uh, you know, uh, as opposed to, say, build an entire Linux kernel in a week. Um, I'd learned pretty quickly that I can't do that. I'd need to scale it down, make it smaller. Um, uh, and build it over time that way. Uh, it also allowed for experimentation with pushing the envelope. So um, I could try new things and know that uh, even if I pushed myself this week in a particular way, the worst that could happen is I'd fail for that one week and then I would learn something from it. Uh, so failing a one week sprint doesn't hurt as much as failing a 10 year project. Uh, you can actually take what you learned and use it to build a bigger success. So the failures can be used to make adjustments and adapt to the circumstances. Uh, so it allows for a lot more adaptability uh, than not using that. Another thing that uh, a personal scrum allows for is control um, with the use of a backlog. Um, it allows me to see all the possible skills I could learn. Uh, it allows for in the moment prioritization of those skills as well, um, based off of what I learn in meetups. Um, and it allows for knowledge gained for, from talks and meetups uh, to be implemented immediately. I find out, oh, this isn't really the thing, I can go ahead and change that. Or some mentor tells me I need to do X instead of Y, I can go ahead and do that. Um, that's, uh, that is something that I can do. And I can also finish what I started this way because every week I am finishing what I start for that week. Um, so whatever is the most important right now is selected for the next sprint. Let's say that um, I'm busy learning Ruby, but then I find out there's this uh, great Python conference that I can go to. Well, 
um, for the next couple of weeks, I can say, all right, we're going to put Ruby on hold and we're just going to learn Python so that I can ramp up for this conference so that I have something to say when I get there, which is great. Um, so whatever is the most important right now is selected for the next sprint. Um, it also allows for improvement using retrospectives. And this is probably one of the most valuable things that a solo scrum can allow for. Uh, and uh, an opportunity, it, it's an opportunity to evaluate what's working and what isn't and make adjustments. Uh, it also is the feedback mechanism that allows for continuous process improvement. Uh, it is also very psychological and emotional, so don't shy away from that. Um, uh, be vulnerable. Uh, be willing to uh, admit what is actually going on and how you're actually feeling. That is very much a part of it. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, it allowed for me to tell myself the truth and then move forward from that. So yeah, here are some results from practicing the solo scrum. For one thing, it created an accelerated development for me. Um, I was able to learn what I needed to learn quickly and, uh, and get exactly what I needed to learn uh, in order to get what I needed done done. Uh, it also helped to control over all of the complexity. Um, it also allowed for a focus on uh, relevance. Uh, whatever is most needed is what I would do. Uh, it also allowed for me to have increased self-knowledge about what I was capable of, which was huge. Um, that is really, really, really important. Um, who was it? I'm pretty sure it was Socrates who said, know thyself. Um, but that also might have been Plato, or it could have been Aristotle. It was one of those Greeks, though. Um, managed risk. Uh, this is another thing that's really, really big about having a solo scrum, is the fact that you can manage the, the risk uh, in what you do and make bold choices and experiments and learn from them quickly rather than uh, being afraid to try things because you don't want to jeopardize a huge project or um, making a risk and then finding out 10 years later, oh, guess what? Your life is ruined. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that um, with the managed risk. Uh, there's less wasted time uh, because you're able to focus. There's less wasted resources because of the fact that you're not uh, looking in all directions. Again, focus. Uh, it allows for small failures that fuel big successes. So uh, what does a uh, self-learning solo scrummer look like? It doesn't really require that much. Uh, you don't need any experience. Um, all you need is to, to start. Uh, you, don't need, you need limited time. You need some, uh, maybe 10 hours a week. Uh, you don't need any money for this. All you need to do is have the knowledge of how to go about uh, doing this for yourself. Um, a, there's a, you have a lot to learn. Uh, anything where it is a vastly complex thing that you need to learn, uh, and you can only learn a certain amount of that, and you need to know exactly what you need to know right now. Uh, very good for that. Uh, it's also great for the insatiable curious, ins insatiably curious as well. Um, and uh, that is something that I think you will need as a, uh, a solo scrummer. Uh, also, you need courageous honesty, especially when it comes to retrospectives. Be honest with yourself. Uh, don't be afraid to write down things that are very personal and very vulnerable because you need to know that about yourself. And if you look at my Go Scrum Yourself uh, repo on GitHub, you'll see that I did exactly that. Um, you need vast stockpiles of passion as well. Uh, that is something that you can't do without. No matter what you do, do it with passion. Uh, do it with care. Um, so, just to say this, uh, that this really does work, at least it worked for me, which is that it was July when I learned about Scrum. And it was April when I started my apprenticeship at 8th Light, my very first software job uh, out of retail sales. Um, so, that's pretty much what I have to say about that. Um, if you have any questions, of course, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, this channel probably has a bunch of options for that as well. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, right now you can find me at 8th Light. Um, and uh, I'll see you around. Uh, happy scrumming. <laughs>